A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 8th of December 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. We have chosen news articles from 5th December as well. So without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. This article here talks about the border tension between Guyana and Venezuela. See the border tensions are currently in news because recently Venezuela held a referendum on whether it should exercise sovereignty over Esquibo. Esquibo is an oil rich region and it is a disputed territory west of the Esquibo river. The territory is claimed by both Guyana and Venezuela but the Guyanese claim has been accepted internationally. So the article here says that instead of escalating the tensions the dispute must be settled amicably. This is the crux of the article given here. So in this context let us discuss briefly about the issue between Venezuela and Guyana. It is very important for prelims so make a note of it. Now look at this map. In this map the area shaded orange is Venezuela, the area shaded dark green is Guyana and the area shaded light green is the disputed Esquibo region. Now as I said earlier, the Venezuela-Guyana border dispute revolves around the ownership of the Esquipo region. Unlike all border disputes, this one also dates back to the colonial era. In the 19th century, both Venezuela and Guyana, which was formerly British Guyana, were colonies of Spain and Britain respectively. The border between the two territories, that is between the Spanish Venezuela and the British Guyana, were settled through the 1899 Arbitral Award, also known as the Paris Arbitration. The 1899 Award granted the entire mouth of the Orinoco River and the land on either side to Venezuela. It granted the land to the east extending to the Esquibo River to the United Kingdom. So according to the award, the entire disputed region belongs to Guyana. But Venezuela has contested the validity of this agreement. Venezuela argued it was not part of the 1899 agreement and it was an illegal imposition by a colonial power. So over the years efforts have been made to find a resolution through diplomatic means and international forums. The United Nations has played a role in facilitating dialogue between the two countries to reach a peaceful solution. However, the dispute remains unsolved causing tension between Venezuela and Guyana. But the issue pretty much remained dormant. Border tensions started escalating due to the discovery of potentially significant oil resources off the coast of Guyana. The presence of these oil resources has added complexity to the dispute as both the countries have sought to assert their right and claims in the region. Another reason why this issue is again gaining momentum is due to the upcoming elections in Venezuela. The approval rating of Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has recently gone down due to the bad state of the economy, particularly shortage of essentials and hyperinflation. So this border issue was brought into limelight to distract the voters. This is about the Venezuela Guyana border dispute. So with these learnt points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this explainer article. It talks about the need to transform our agri-food systems for a sustainable future. The article briefly discusses the issue with the current system of agriculture and the need to transform it in a sustainable basis. Now suddenly it is in news because recently the Food and Agriculture Organization FAO released a report called State of Food and Agriculture Report. It gave a shocking data about the hidden cost of our global agri-food systems. The report estimates that the cost of our global agri-food system will exceed around 10 trillion dollars. This is even more shocking for the middle income countries like India where the cost accounts for nearly 11 percentage of the GDP. Here the term hidden cost is very important. Hidden cost is nothing but the environmental cost due to farming like emission of greenhouse gases and nitrogen emission, water use, land use changes and etc. These hidden cost includes both 
health hidden cost and social hidden cost. The health hidden cost includes the loss in productivity due to unhealthy dietary patterns, obesity and etc. The social hidden cost or poverty and productivity losses associated with undernutrition. So here comes the question what is the reason behind these hidden cost? See the report blamed unsustainable agricultural practices like intensive cropping and monocropping are the reasons for these escalating hidden cost. So the article blames the government for its skewed support mechanism. Let us understand the entire concept using a case study. See we know that under the National Food Security Act 2013, 65 percentage of households are around 800 million people in India are legally assured a right to food at subsidized rates through PDS. PDS is public distribution system. To meet this requirement FCI that is the Food Corporation of India will do procurement of food crops and maintain a central pool of food grains in the country. But the problem is it heavily favors rice and wheat. In 2019 to 2020, the FCA procured 341.32 lakh million tons of wheat and 514.27 lakh million tons of rice. In contrast, the Indian government procured a total of only 3.49 lakh million tons of coarse grains like jowar, bajra, ragi, maize and barley. This is reflected in the results as the area under cultivation of coarse grains dropped by 20% between 1966 to 1967 and 2017 to 2018. Whereas the area under rice and wheat increased by nearly 20% and 56% respectively. So this case study highlights how a government's support system is increasing the hidden cost of our global agri food system. Now let us understand the impacts of water intensive crops. See firstly it undermines the traditional knowledge and agriculture. As you all know the green revolution and intensive cultivation ensured food security in the country. But they also led to the marketing of high yielding varieties of paddy and wheat on agriculture. They exclusively constitutes more than 70 percentage of India's agricultural production. The infusion of seeds purchased from MNCs and fertilizer undermined seed sovereignty of the nation. It dismantled the indigenous knowledge system. Secondly, with respect to the ecological consequences, it led to decreased soil fertility, reduction in the groundwater table, excessive extraction of groundwater due to export of virtual water, increased alkalinity and etc. Thirdly, this model of privatization and deregulation of agricultural inputs also increased indebtedness among agrarian households. Let us understand this using some data. In 2013, the debt to asset ratio of a farmer's household in India was 630 percentage higher than in 1992. So this reflects agriculture in India has increasingly become unviable as the average monthly household income of a former household is around only 10,816 rupees. So with all these issues, the goal of doubling of farmers income will remain a distant dream. Finally, this system has a great impact on the health. Know that unsustainable agriculture affects the biodiversity of the region and contributes to air and water pollution. The increase usage of fertilizers may have a bio magnifying effect on the body. We also could not forget our national capital turned toward gas chamber due to stubble burning of agri based in Punjab. So these are all some of the issues surrounding water intensive crops. So with this basic understanding now let us see what can be done to address this issue and ensure sustainability. Firstly this article talks about shifting to multi cropping system to achieve the triple objectives of protecting the farmers well being improving the nutritional outcome of our communities and positively impact ecological health. Here the diversified multi cropping systems rooted in agroecology principles could be a viable solution to revitalize degraded land and soil. For this to happen, we should improve the local practices to ensure a localized solution. For example, the practice of Akadi Salu in Karnataka, which involves intercropping with a combination of legumes, pulses, oil seeds, trees, shrubs and livestock. This approach enables cash provision from commercial crops, food and fodder production and offers ecology services 
such as nitrogen fixation and pest traps and it also supports the local biodiversity. They also collectively contribute to improving soil health. Secondly, shifting to various climate resilient crop varieties like millets could increase the fertility of soil in the long term. For example, the government should redirect the subsidies that is the MSPs to climate resilient crop varieties. In this way, we can pay farmers for their contribution to sustain our natural capital instead of incentivizing them to deplete it. Thirdly, scientific cropping pattern should be made popular amongst the farmers. The article here highlights the visual representation of a diversified form. It would look like allocating 70% for commercial crops, 20% for food and fodder, and 10% for environmental services like oil seeds. It advocates for the reduction of commercial crops to 50% and border crops could be replaced with locally sustainable tree species for fruits and fodder. Finally, we should note that it is unrealistic to expect farmers to shift away from mono cultivation of rice and wheat overnight. This transition need to be systematic. It should allow farmers to adjust gradually. So in that line, self-help groups and farmers producer organization, they could be encouraged. So these are all some of the very important takeaway points from this news article discussion. So these learned points and now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. Recently, the Secretary General of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, CVF, praised India for investing in clean energy projects. He note that former Maldives President Mr. Mohammed Nasid is the current Secretary General of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. He said that more Indian companies are investing in clean energy projects in Maldives and in other climate vulnerable countries. He praised that this is a good investment of India which will help the climate vulnerable countries to tackle climate change associated effects. This is the crux of the news article given here. So, we shall understand few facts about Climate Vulnerable Forum CVF in this news article discussion. See, the CVF was found in November 2009 by the Maldives government. It was founded at Male, which is the capital city of Maldives. The CVF is basically an international forum for countries that are most threatened by climate change. To put it simply, the CVF serves as a platform for countries that are highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Apart from this, the forum also serves as a South-South cooperation platform for participating governments. This helps the member countries to act together to deal with climate change. Talking about the members of CVF, see when the CVF was founded in 2009, it was composed of only 10 member countries but currently the forum is composed of 58 members. The member countries are from various regions like Africa, Asia, Caribbean, Latin America and Pacific. These countries represent some 1.4 billion people worldwide. The member countries of the CVF are displayed here, you can go through it. Talking about the presidency of the forum, the CVF is led by a rounding chair. Once a country is chosen as the chair, it will serve as a chair for the period of two years. Note that Ghana, which is a country in Africa, is the current chair for the period 2022 to 2024. Finally, let us see the working of the forum. Firstly, the forum is actively involved in building cooperation, knowledge and awareness on climate change issues. Secondly, the forum is working to achieve maximal climate resilience in order to adapt to climate change impacts. Finally, the forum is working to meet 100% domestic renewable energy production as soon as possible. These are all some of the very important points that you have to remember about CVF. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this middle page article. As you all know, election to the five state assemblies has concluded recently. The article discusses the deciding factors of voting in Chhattisgarh state. See, before the election, the Congress party was in power in Chhattisgarh, but in the recent election, the BJP won the majority seats and it is going to form the government. So, the article here discusses the factors responsible for the Congress being voted out of power in Chhattisgarh. The article highlights the high unemployment rate is the 
main factor which create a distrust among the voters corruption and price rise or some other factors the article reports that more than one third of people with higher education in chatisgarh were unhappy with the efforts of the previous congress government to generate employment apart from this two out of every 10 of the urban voters and the poor in chatisgarh were also disappointed with the previous congress government regarding its inability to deal with unemployment so from these points we can say that unemployment rate is the main factor responsible for the defeat of the congress party in chatisgarh this is the crux of the news article given here so in this context we will approach this topic with mains answer writing approach now look at this question discuss the unemployment scenario of india and what measures can be taken to tackle this unemployment wave see this question can be asked in gs paper 3 and it is a very straightforward question so in the introduction part but since the question is about unemployment we can write the definition of unemployment the intro can be like unemployment refers to the situation when some people are willing and able to work but they do not have or they do not find a paid job to say it in technical terms the unemployment rate is the percentage of people in the labor force who are unemployed some of the causes of unemployment include reduction of the labor force workforce fluctuations technological changes and etc so this way you can write the introduction for the question moving on to the main body of the answer see in the main body of the answer you can split the content into two headings first you have to write about the scenario of unemployment in india second you have to write some measures to tackle unemployment in india so first we will see the scenario of unemployment in india here let us analyze the scenario by looking into the data from the recently released periodic labor force survey plfs annual report 2022 to 2023 according to the report the unemployment rate in urban areas had decreased from 8.4 percentage in 2017 to 18 to 4.4 percentage in 2022 to 23 whereas in urban areas the unemployment rate has decreased 9.5 percentage in 2017 to 18 to 7 percentage in 2022 to 23 now let us see the changes in female and male unemployment rates the report shows that unemployment rate for male in india has decreased from 8.7 percentage in 2017 to 18 to 5.1 percentage in 2022 to 23 likewise the unemployment rate for females had decreased from 9 percentage in 2017 to 18 to 5.1 percentage in 2022 to 23 overall the report shows that there was a decrease in overall unemployment rate in india this is a positive sign but still these unemployment rate are very high now let us see the reasons for this high unemployment rate in india see the first reason is 2016 demonetization as we all know the central government demonetized 1000 rupees and 500 rupees note in 2016 the demonetization caused economic disruption particularly in the informal sector this resulted in job losses and contributed to high unemployment rate the second reason is the implementation of the goods and services taxes the government has introduced the gst in 2017 it was introduced with the aim of simplifying the tax structure but still it causes some disruption in the economy which in turn affects businesses and employment thirdly covid-19 pandemic the covid-19 pandemic and the subsequent lockdown measures impacted the indian economy as a result some businesses were closed and the economic activities were halted temporarily these factors resulted in a surge in the unemployment rate note that still some businesses are struggling for recovery which is affecting employment and the final important reason is inflationary pressure see india is facing high inflationary pressures over the years high inflation rates can erode the purchasing power of consumers this leads to reduced demand for goods and services and this situation can have a cascading effect on businesses resulting in cost cutting measures including layoffs and hiring freezes this is also one of the reason for high unemployment rates So this way you can finish the first part of the question moving on to the second part here you have to suggest some measures to tackle unemployment in India 
Firstly, the government should promote skill development and vocational training. For example, the government can collaborate with private institutions and industry experts to offer comprehensive training programs aligned with market demands. This would equip individuals with industry relevant skills, making them more employable. Secondly, strengthening education and industry collaboration. This can lead to development of curriculum aligned with industry needs. This would equip students with practical skills and improve their employability. Thirdly, encouraging entrepreneurship and startups can also have a positive impact. For example, promoting entrepreneurship can create new job opportunities. So, the government can provide financial incentives for startups. This encourages innovation and entrepreneurship resulting in employment generation. Finally, enhancing rural employment opportunities will help to address the unemployment situation. See, a substantial portion of India's population resides in rural areas where employment opportunities are often limited. So by focusing on rural development schemes like agriculture modernization, rural infrastructure development and skill training for rural industries, the employment prospects can be improved in rural areas. Finally, the potential of digitalization and technology can be harnessed to help generate employment. So these are all some of the ways that can be taken to tackle unemployment in India. Now moving forward, in the conclusion part, you can write that India is currently the most populous country in the world. So it is also rich in demographic dividend which means India is having a high number of working population. So the Indian government should devise suitable policies to tap the potential of the working population. And on the other hand, it will empower the youths of India economically and it will foster the economic growth of India. So, this way you can end the conclusion for this particular question. So, these learnt points. Now, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. The article says that the essence of Buddhism, which is a book written by Professor P. Lakshmi Narasu, has been appreciated as the best book on Buddhism by B. R. Ambedkar. So, in this news article discussion today, we are going to see few points about Buddhism. See, in the 6th century BCE, India witnessed a wave of urbanization within the Gangetic Plains. At the same time, certain sections of the population were fed up with the prevailing Vedic rituals and the rigid caste system. They were seeking an alternative. These conditions favored the rise of Buddhism in India. Buddha's teachings swiftly gained popularity across northern India. It gained popularity among the merchants, artisans and political classes. Now before diving further into Buddhism, let us see some points about Buddha. Gautama Buddha was born in 563 BC in Lumbini which is located in present day Nepal. His parents are Queen Maya and King Siddhodana of the Sakyan Kingdom. Buddha was originally known as Siddhartha Gautam. One of the pivotal moments in the life of Buddha is the attaining Nirvana in Bodhgaya. After attaining Nirvana, he delivered his first sermon known as Dharma Chakra Parvartana at the Deer Park in Sarnath near Varnasi. Here Nirvana in Buddhism signifies the cessation of desire marking the end of suffering. Gautama Buddha attained Mahapari Nirvana that is death at Kushinagar in UP at age of 80 around 483 BC. Now talking about Buddhism, see the foundation of Buddhism revolves around the three jewels or tri ratna. The first jewel is Buddha himself who is the enlightened one. The second one is Dhamma which is the teaching of Buddha. The third one is Sangha which is the monastic order. The fundamental principles of Buddhism are encapsulated in the four noble truths. They are the truth of suffering, the truth of origin of suffering, the truth of cessation of suffering and the truth of path to the cessation of suffering. That is Dukkha, Samudaya, Nirodha and Marga. Buddhism also puts forth the adherence to the noble eightfold path to attain freedom and peace. They are given here, you can go through it. Buddhism advocated the middle path that is Madhya Maga as a way to liberation. Buddha also rejected the authenticity of Vedas. Unlike Jainism which believes that everything in nature, even a stone and water has a soul of its own, Buddhism does not believe in the concept of soul. These are some of the important points about Buddhism. Moving forward, let us see some points about Tripitaka. See following Buddha's 
Maha Pari Nirvana in 1483 BC at Kushinagar, efforts were made to compile his teachings. This led to the convening of four Buddhist councils over 500 years. In these Buddhist councils, the teachings of Buddha were consolidated into the Vinaya, Sutta, and Abhidhamma Pitakas. These three are collectively known as Tripitakas. An additional point to note here is that they are all written in the Pali language. Finally, before concluding, let us see a few points about Vinaya Sutta and Abhidhamma Pitaka. First, let us take Sutta Pitaka. Sutta Pitaka contains the sermons and the teachings of Gautama Buddha. It includes a wide range of subjects from ethical teachings to philosophical discussions and practical guidance for spiritual practice. Vinaya Pitaka contains the rules and guidelines for the monastic discipline. It outlines the code of conduct, disciplinary rules and protocols for the Sangha monastic community. Then the Abhidhamma Pitaka contains more specialized and systematic psychological teachings. It presents a more analytical and abstract understanding of the Buddha's teaching found in the Sutta Pitaka. So these are all some of the very important points that you have to remember about Buddhism with these learned points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. This news article is about Magar crocodiles. It mainly focuses on the Magar crocodiles that live in Moya River in Tamil Nadu. The article talks about how the Adivasis in this region learned to coexist with the crocodiles leading to almost no negative interactions. The article also talks about the threats faced by the Magar crocodiles living in the Moya River. This is about the article. So in this news article discussion, let us cover the basics about the Magar crocodiles. See the Magar crocodiles, which is also called marsh crocodile, is a large reptile species. It is found primarily in freshwater habitats across the Indian subcontinent. Makar crocodiles are carnivorous and primarily feed on fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds and small mammals. They are opportunistic hunters and will prey on whatever is possible in their habitat. As they grow larger, their diet may include larger prey like deer and domestic animals. Now what about their habitat? See as I said earlier, these crocodiles live in freshwater environments like rivers, lakes, marshes and ponds. They generally prefer slow moving waters. They also prefer areas with ample vegetation and places for basking. Now look at this image of a mugger basking. Coming back, these crocodiles can also adapt to brackish water habitat and are sometimes found in man-made reservoirs or irrigation canals. This is about the habitat of mugger crocodiles. Talking about their distribution, they are native to parts of the Indian subcontinent. They can be found in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal and Bangladesh. In India, it is reported to be present in 15 of India's states including much of the Ganga river drainage. Significant population occur in middle Ganga that is Bihar and Jharkhand, Chambal river, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh and in Gujarat. And I mentioned earlier in the article around 100 muggers are found in the Moya river. Talking about their conservation status, see the mugger crocodiles are listed as vulnerable by IOCN. They are placed under Schedule 1 of WPA 1972 and they are placed under Appendix 1 of sites. Finally, let us see the threats faced by the muggers. The first issue is the destruction of their natural habitat due to human activities like agriculture, urbanization and dam construction. Additionally, illegal poaching for their valuable skin and meat as well as the utilization of their body parts in traditional machine remains a pressing concern for the species survival. In India, the introduction of non-native fish into the water bodies where mugger crocodiles reside poses a significant threat. This disruption to the ecosystem can impact their food sources and environment. Furthermore, the use of dynamite for fishing in their habitat is an alarming issue. This causes disruption and potential harm to the crocodile population. Lastly, the proliferation of invasive species like Prasopis, Juliflora along river banks disrupts and encroaches upon the nesting sites of these crocodiles. This also poses a severe threat to their reproduction and survival. So these are all some of the threats faced by mugger crocodiles. 
so it is very essential to note that continued conservation efforts and public awareness are crucial to protect these animals and their habitat from further decline so these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now look at this question which one of the following describes the best the concept of nirvana in buddhism so the correct answer here is option a the extinction of the flame of desire now look at the second question you have to find how many of the following countries share border with guyana the correct answer is option b only three here in this map you can see that brazil suriname and venezuela share border with guyana moving on here four statements are given and you have to find which crocodilian species is represented in the statement here look at the second statement this statement says this species has a unique thin and elongated snout and the fourth statement says it is the most aquatic of all crocodilian for it never moves far from the water so with these two statements you can easily find the answer the correct answer here is option b gharial gharial is a critically endangered species moving on here two statements about climate vulnerable forum is given and you have to find which of the statements given above is or are correct statement 1 says it only consists of island nations around the world that are mostly affected by climate change so this statement is incorrect it is not only consists of island nation but also other countries from different continents statement 2 says maldives is the current chair of the forum of the 2022 to 24 period this statement is incorrect in the discussion itself we saw right ghana is the current chair of the cvf for the period 2022 to 2024 so the correct answer here is option d neither one nor two so the question displayed here is the mains practice question for you today just go through the question try to answer it in the comment section with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel now thank you so much for listening